Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on what time it is that you are watching us today. We are here in the sanctuary of St. Thomas UCC in Lingelstown, and while we are not having public services in this building or other events during this time, there are still opportunities to gather as a church body. We're doing that online these days, offering Sunday worship and midweek studies and conversations. You can find more information about that on our website at the eChurch page, so I invite you to take a look at that. We're also bringing some regular communication from our office with updates about the schedules. There are ways to get in touch with people about praying for one another, and also if you're aware of people with financial needs, even yourself, if you give a, send an email or a phone call to the office, we can put you in touch with people that can help with that. Let me encourage you to take opportunities to connect with others around you, even if it's in some ways that you're not accustomed to, and to keep looking for ways to learn and to grow and to serve, because even if we're not here, we can still be the church. But for now, we are here, at least a few of us are. Betsy Smith is playing the organ for us today. Michael Swartz is on the keyboard, and Craig Bomberger is making it possible to record this service. And we are going to worship with you through reading and praying, through songs. We're going to be looking into God's word. We're going to be listening to what God has for us. You'll notice along the way some prompts on your screen that will help you participate in this service. You can also download a program if you'd like to follow along, and that's next to the link that got you here. So for now, no matter where you are, whatever you're going through, I invite you to settle in for the next little while. Take a breath with me now, and let's trust the Lord to walk with us through this time of worship. Please pray with me. Thanks, loving God, for the day that you have made. Thanks that in the midst of a lot of things that are in flux that you do not change. Thanks that we can worship you in different ways, perhaps from what we're accustomed to, and yet ways that still make sense, ways that still make a difference in our lives and in the lives of those around us. And so as we settle into this now, God, please prepare our hearts and minds to receive what you have for us, to look for you, to enjoy this time with you and connected with others. So we commit it to you through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our call to worship comes from Psalm 130, and if you'd like to speak alone, along with me at home, that's fine, and uh, Craig and Betsy are going to read as well. Psalm 130, I wait for the Lord, my soul waits. And, and in, in his, his word, word I put, put my, my hope. hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning. 
more, more than, than watchmen wait, wait for the morning. morning. Oh, 
in our situation today. That hymn was written in 1750-something, so almost 300 years ago. And it's uh, perhaps worth remembering that people have gone through challenging times for a long time. And to hear this expression of faith and confidence, one of the lines in the verse says, Thy hope, thy confidence, let nothing shake. And there's good encouragement in those words as we continue to move through our days. Well, as we come before the Lord now for a time of confession, we want to be remembering what has been going on over these past days and bringing that to the Lord. There have been seasons or times or episodes where we have slipped, where we have turned away from what the Lord wants. We want to be looking to the Lord for strength in living well and also to confess what we have done that is not pleasing to God. So we are encouraged from Micah 6, 8 in this time of confession where the prophet says, he has shown you what is good and what does the Lord require? To, to act, act justly, justly love mercy, and, and walk, walk humbly with, with your God. God. Let us pray. Amen. And then we hear these wonderful words of assurance from Psalm 130. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, who could stand? But with you, there is forgiveness. Amen. The first reading today comes from Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 39. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. 
For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among, among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Our second reading comes from John chapter 11, and this is the passage we'll be looking at during the message as well. So if you have a Bible handy, I'd encourage you to get that and open it to John 11. And if you want to pause here so that you can go find a Bible, that would be fine. This is John chapter 11, starting at verse 1. A man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha, this Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it's for God's glory, so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago the Jews there tried to stone you, and yet you're going back? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see by this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. And God, we're so thankful for the gift of your word, for the way that you communicate with us, for the lessons that you offer, for the stories that are here to encourage us along the way. We pray now that as we go into it, you'd be speaking to us through it by your spirit that our hearts and minds might be shaped by you, that more and more we might want your ways. Amen. Well, Jesus has been moving around the land of Israel. He's in Galilee in the north, through Samaria in the center of the country, and then Judea in the south. And right now, he's somewhere other than Judea. He's been doing good, but opposition has also been mounting. Those who are pushing against what Jesus was determined to do, and even though the pressure can be significant, he's not distracted. He is resolute about carrying out his ministry. In the midst of all that's going on, he receives news about Lazarus, a friend of his who is sick. We know what this can be like when our own lives are full of the things that are occupying us and some of them pretty significant when one more thing shows up and we wonder how much can we manage? 
How many cats can we herd? How many balls can we juggle? And how exactly are we supposed to direct our time and energy? When Jesus gets this news about his friend Lazarus, his response is to delay. Now Mary and Martha have sent word to him, Lazarus is sick, and the very clear implication is, Jesus, come now. But instead, Jesus stays where he is, and he waits. John doesn't tell us why this is the case, but so far, we've been seeing plenty of evidence that Jesus' actions are intentional and that he moves as the Spirit directs. And yet, while he stays in this place, Lazarus dies. That's significant, without question. But what else has been going on in these days when Jesus wasn't traveling to Bethany? Has he been praying? Has he been talking with his disciples? Has he been healing? Has he been teaching those who have interest? Some or all of that is likely too, given what we've seen of Jesus. But then, after two days, let's go, he says. His disciples object. They say, wait a minute, Rabbi. Bethany, where Mary and Martha and Lazarus live, Bethany is just on the outskirts of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem is the hot spot of opposition. You don't want to go down there. But he's firm. And so the disciples agree. In fact, one of them, Thomas, goes so far as to say, well, let's go with him that we may die with him. It's a bold statement. It at least it shows the level of commitment that these disciples have to their friend Jesus. And they go. As they enter Bethany, as they get near the house, they're met by Martha who comes out to see Jesus. And she speaks to him. In verse 21, Martha says, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. There's an example of her faith. There's a demonstration of her trust in Jesus, of her belief that Jesus can make a difference. And this is followed by a conversation between Martha and Jesus that ranges pretty far. There's some deep theology going on as the two of them talk back and forth, and it concludes with an affirmation by Martha in verse 27. She says, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. This is the clearest expression of understanding regarding Jesus' ministry and who he is from anyone we've heard from so far in this gospel. And it's offered by a woman whose brother has just died as she is talking to one whom she believes could have prevented that. Martha goes back to her house and tells her sister Mary that Jesus has arrived. Mary goes out to meet Jesus and she falls at his feet in verse 32, we hear her speak, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. It's the same thing that Martha has said to Jesus. But Mary is not looking for a conversation. She's weeping. It's pure, raw emotion. And when Jesus sees this, John tells us in verse 33 that he was deeply moved he asks, where have you laid him? And they say, come. And then John says, Jesus wept. It's a powerful story. One from which we learn more about Jesus and also about his friends, people like these sisters, Mary and Martha. We learn about their faith, which is remarkable. And then we see how Jesus interacts, first with Martha, he's very rational, and then with Mary, it's all emotion. 
he's bringing, he's offering what each of them needs because he knows that one size does not fit all. And then there's Lazarus, the brother who has died, the one whom Jesus will raise. There's more to this story, and I encourage you at some point, uh, fairly soon, to read the rest of this chapter. We'll be talking about Lazarus' piece in the story during our online live service Sunday morning. You might want to dial in for that as well. But for now, let's let this story of uncertainty and stress speak to us. Because we are familiar with circumstances like these, with emotions that swirl in times like these, especially in days like these. The details might be different between us and them, but the concerns are very similar. We can feel the anxiety, the fear, maybe even some anger at what's going on around us, at what is happening to us. And so a story like this is a good one for us to hear. It invites us to see Jesus as one who meets us where we are, who offers what we need. We see in the story, for instance, how sometimes, perhaps often, there's a delay between the arrival of a need and the addressing of that need. How sometimes we have to live in the tension between that, between those. And how patience is necessary. That might spark us to prayer, by the way, to ask that between the dealing with the need, between having the need and having the need met, we ne may need to be asking the Lord for patience. We're also seeing Jesus' compassion and interest, how he joins us in our grief. He doesn't make light of the situation that they're going through or that we go through even if he knows what's still to come down the road. And of course, we see power. Now, God's power may not always appear when we want it or in the form that we expect, but God's power is always available for what we need. And so this story with Mary and Martha and Lazarus and the disciples and Jesus, who is a good and faithful friend, powerful, and calling us, even as he was calling them, to trust him as they move through their days. We're in a season that calls for a lot of faith. And sometimes we wonder what we can do or what we should do. One of the opportunities for us in times like this is to pray. To pray for those around us, to pray for those we know, to pray for those we hear about, to pray for ourselves. And so I'm going to invite you to join me now for a season of prayer. I'm going to lead us in some categories of prayer and as those bring different ideas and people to mind, join your voice with mine as we pray to the Lord. Trusting God that you hear us, thankful for inviting us to come like this. And so we do. We pray in faith, believing that you hear us, that you are at work, that you will be at work. And so guide us as we pray. We lift up before you government leaders who also are trying to figure things out without a lot of maps or scripts. We pray for wisdom, for discernment. We pray for constructive collaboration. We pray for your church. And we know that your church is all over this world and that different ones are facing different kinds of circumstances and realities, and so we pray, God, for patience. We pray for courage. We pray for confidence. We pray that your people would be looking for ways to serve, 
that they would be adapting and creative in, the way, in how they offer that. We pray for this church. As we continue to figure out what it means to be church at this time and in these days, God, please guide us. Help us to recognize the opportunities you're putting before us and to walk into those with confidence and energy. And Lord, we pray for the people we know, those who are close to us, those who are part of our network of relationships, those who are worried, those who are ill, those that have a lot of questions in front of them. Lord, be at work in these lives, we pray. Would you also be showing us ways that we can be ministers in your name on their behalf? We pray too for ourselves that we'd be open to what you're wanting to do in us and through us. That we'd be looking to you. That we'd be leaning towards you. That we would, would be faithful in living as you direct. Help us to trust you to supply what we need. Give us grace and faith and patience and peace for the times that we're asked to wait. Oh Lord, all of this we ask and all of this we bring in the name of the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Come to your people as we go.
of our worship is the giving of offerings as a way of demonstrating our gratitude to God for God's provision, as well as contributing to the support of ministry in and through churches like St. Thomas. If you have an offering that you'd like to contribute in this way, you can do that by sending it, by mailing it to the church office. The deacons are collecting these offerings and tracking them, depositing them in the bank and then using those funds for ongoing ministry. Usually when we're together, we have people going through the pews collecting offerings. That's not gonna happen today. Then at the end of that, we sing the doxology. That will happen today. So. God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy
The Apostle Paul was familiar with stress, with changing circumstances, with lots of challenges in his life. He wrote letters to people encouraging them as they were going through those kinds of things as well. And one of those letters to the Philippians carries these words in chapter 4. Words that Paul writes while he is in jail. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That's a promise that Paul makes. It's one that many have seen true in their lives. And it's our prayer for you as this day continues and as these days continue, that you might experience the peace of God that transcends all understanding, guarding your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.